May the Lord grant us his guidance, his peace, his comfort, and his, and his assurance that we are indeed saved by his means of grace for us. Today, as I mentioned, we're taking a little bit of a different tra- tack, and we're going to look at the sacraments in a little different way. Oftentimes, when we ha- have sermons, we talk about law and gospel, we focus on that grace, but very rarely do we take a moment to look and say, well, what does it mean to say that we ha- celebrate the sacraments, that we indeed have the means of grace? And so today, we're going to look at what indeed a sacrament is, how we define it, how it's been defined in history, how it still continues to live on today as a gift from God. We'll also go ahead and next week we're going to look at the idea of the question of worthiness. What, what has made us worthy? Not ourselves, but our Lord. And finally, we're going to look at what is the big difference between, uh, between the Lutherans and other Christians and, and why it's so significant, our theology of what a sacrament is. But today as we come to look at this, as we look at the sacraments, we look at two sacraments in particular. And those are two that are celebrated in the Lutheran church. Baptism and the Lord's Supper, you know this. But you also probably know that throughout the church, there's different sacraments celebrated. For instance, if you were to walk into a Roman Catholic church or into an Eastern Orthodox church, they have seven different sacraments. Seven for the number of completeness and seven because they believe that these are God's gift of sacrament to them. If you were to celebrate a service with the Salvation Army, they have zero sacraments. They have no sacramental theology whatsoever. However, if you look across the board, most churches... Most Christian churches celebrate two sacraments, and that is baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, as we look at that definition, though, it's important to start with, where does that term sacrament come from? And as we look at the word sacrament, we actually see that it's just a transliteration of the word sacramentum. Sacramentum is a word that comes uh, to us from Latin. It's actually a word that was used much longer than, or wait, let's start over with that. It was used before the church was officially founded as the church in the third century when sacramentum became used regularly in the church. But initially, the word sacramentum was used among uh, the, those who were offering oaths or sacrifices to false gods. It was their vow that they made that either they would come back and offer a sacrifice if that god blessed their field, or it was their, they would offer that, that sacrifice and say, I vow to do something else because of this. And so that word sacramentum is wrapped up in vow. Now, as the time went on, as we see, have seen in our own language, this word sacrament actually has taken on a new, uh, a new meaning. And it's actually sacramentum, by the time it was used in the church, was more used among military men. That as military men, they would make an oath to their country. They would make an oath to Rome that they would indeed be faithful. That they would follow through with what they said. That even if their life was at risk, if, that, if there was certain death, that they would willingly die for their country. And this is when it became, like I said, about the time that it was used in the church. Now, early on, it was not the word that was used, but sacramentum became used at the time of the third century by a a theologian by the name of Tertullian. You may have heard this uh, name before, Tertullian. Tertullian was a uh, was actually uh, one of the, one of our early the, uh, church fathers who gave us direction and instruction, helped us to see actually indeed what the uh, the difference between uh, our baptism today, infant baptism, and the, and actually fo- that it follows in line with the early church. That was one of the things Tertullian wrote against. Actually, was infant baptism, which shows us uh, an evidence of in the early church that baptism was done for infants. He was later labeled a heretic. But, uh, but he was the first to use that term, sacramentum. Before this, actually, we go back to Scripture for a different word. A word that was used that is still actually used in, uh, in Greek Orthodox today, where they might still use that, the Greek language in their services. And that's the word Paul used in our text, for our epistle, when he wrote, Men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Those secret things of God is actually a Greek word, one word, mysterion. And mysterion is a word that's translated as secret things there, hidden things. But I like how the King James translates it because it really brings a greater understanding. And, they, and the King James translates that as mysteries, the mysteries of God. And how true that is of our sacraments, isn't it? Our sacraments really are those mysteries which God has given us because we don't completely understand how Christ can be present in bread and wine. We don't completely understand how water and the word can provide forgiveness. But we do know that God says that is the case. That God gives us that promise. That God tells us that in his word and with word and water, forgiveness can come in new life. With bread and wine and body and blood, healing for the soul, forgiveness can come. But so that word mysterion, 
it really it does cover those mysteries that God gives to us. And it's interesting because we see how mysterious these sacraments are. Because as we look through the history of the church, well, we, we don't ever see a, 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 de- a definition that holds completely. It's a definition where we struggle, we wrestle with it. We try to de- explain exactly what's going on here, but we can't. And as we look pa- th- through the history, we have several people who have contributed, who have helped to shape our theology, but we don't have one person we can say, well, right here, well, I take that back. We, we follow Martin Luther as he has crystallized it. But before that point, we have many different uh, theologians trying to give an explanation. And so we go back to about the third century. And in the third century, we actually have the first uh, official definition, if you will, of what a sacrament is. St. Augustine, he, he very simply defines a sacrament this way. Outward and visible signs of an inward and spiritual grace. Outward and visible signs of an inward and invisible grace. Makes sense, doesn't it? Because as we think about the sacraments, the outward signs, the physical, the inward grace, the forgiveness that comes through them. But it's very broad, isn't it? In the fourth century, as, as Augustine gave us that definition, the church wasn't, wasn't fighting on, over that front. In fact, Augustine's greater problem at this time was a guy by the name of Pelagius. And he was facing the Pelagians and trying to defend that we indeed were corrupted by our original sin and needed God's forgiveness completely. Now, so as he defined this, actually, Augustine would have included in his definition not only the sacraments we have today, not only the sacraments included in the Roman Catholic Church today, but he also included the sacrament, uh, would include in his sacraments the, the creed, which we say every week, and the Lord's Prayer. Now, as you think about that, you maybe are scratching your head a little bit because you're saying, well, wait a minute now. What is the physical element there? Where's the forgiveness of sins? And, and, and that's much later as we see uh, as it comes about. In fact, as we look at our kind of what sh- really shaped our modern understanding of sacraments, we have to fast forward in time quite a bit. And we're going to go forward about 800 years to the 12th century. And I, admittedly, there were other theologians during that time who, who were trying to defend other church fathers who talked about the sacrament. But it wasn't until a guy by the name of Peter Lombard, and this name you may recognize, maybe not, but he wrote a very important piece for the, uh, the Christian church, the Catholic church of the time, and that is the four, se- four, four books of sentences by Peter Lombard. Now, they're commonly called the sentences. Has anybody ever heard of the sentences before? Anybody? No. Well, yes? Uh, Anna's heard of the sentences before. And, and, and it's okay that if you, if you haven't, and I'm glad that you have, because uh, the sentences were what shaped a lot of Catholic and Christian doctrine. And what Peter Lombard sought to do in the 12th century was to sit down and actually write what the, peop- what the, what the faith was, to have a, a, a written-out documentation of what they believed. And as Peter Lombard did this, he actually shaped much of the theology even we have today. Uh, He shaped the theology of Thomas Aquinas, who uh, further boiled down the Catholic faith. He shaped the the faith of Albert the Great, uh, Gabriel Beale, uh, uh, even Martin Luther and uh, and, uh, and, um, John Calvin. And And even to this day, we see touches of these sentences in our writing. Now, Martin Luther was greatly influenced by this, but before we jump there, I want to uh, share with you his definition of what a sacrament was. And now, I'll admit, this is just a, sh- a brief sentence because he really gets into it uh, quite a bit more in his, in his uh, fourth book of the sentences. But this is just a simple uh, summary that he starts off with. A sacrament properly so-called is that which is a sign of God's grace and the visible form of invisible grace in such a way that it carries its image and its cause. That's a bit of a tongue twister, isn't it? Let's break it down a little bit. Let's talk about this in parts. So a sacrament so properly called is a sign of God's grace. What we're seeing there is very similar to what we as Lutherans would say. It is a means of grace. It is forgiveness of sins to people. Okay, so so far we're on page with him. A visible form of invisible grace carrying through Augustine's definition, right? That idea that there is a physical presence. And then finally, in such a way that it carries the image and its cause. Now, this is a very broad definition, isn't it? It's just, it, it talks about the way that it, uh, that it comes about. So very, and very much, we could actually take the Lord's Prayer and put it back in there. 
and we, and we haven't really closed the gap yet. Uh, admittedly, he said there were only seven sacraments uh, that the Catholic Church followed, but, but you could, again, put the Lord's, uh, l- the Lord's Prayer in there because of the fact that uh, the, you know, maybe you might say the visible would be the Word of God as it is proclaimed uh, from Scripture. You would say the means of grace is the forgiveness that we pray for, uh, deliver us from evil, and uh, then finally, uh, then uh, the institution by Christ, but, uh, which is like I, uh, what we're going to get to in a minute with Martin Luther. But like I said, this is a fairly broad term again. And Peter Lombard wasn't seeking to, to uh, change the church. He was simply describing the church at the time. And this is important because as he wrote this, he did very much influence the faith that was to come. A- after him was what was called the scholastic thought. And if you hear that term scholasticism, scholastic thought, you might think of, oh, well, that's the book club that my kids used to order books from. But the scholasticism, scholastic thought, actually was this idea that, uh, well, let me give an illustration would be better, but it was seeking to try and explain with reason and science religion. And the, the funny thing about, maybe a funny example would be, uh, from this idea, 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 ideology, was that you could explain, or count the number of angels uh, dancing on the pin, uh, head of a needle, as Tom Zale likes to talk about. But uh, literally, they, didn't, they knew that they couldn't do that. But they were trying to do these types of things. One of the bad things that came about from scholastic thought, though, was actually a teaching that, that we did have a scintilla, a small piece of grace inside of us, a little piece that we weren't completely corrupted by our original sin, so that we could do something. Bad news bears, because when we're going to talk about this next week, worthiness, uh, we're going to see we're not worthy at all, and there is no worthiness in us, that we have been completely corrupted by our original sin in need of God's full grace. Well, as I said, Peter Lombard was a great influence even on Martin Luther. But before we get to Martin Luther, as much as I'd like to jump to him right away, he was not the only reformer at the time of the Reformation. And as Martin Luther came at, at, in the Reformation, there were two others that you, uh, two other names you may or may not be familiar with. The first is John Calvin, and the second is Ulrich Zwingli. Does anybody recognize those names? John Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli? Okay, a couple people do great. Uh, John Calvin was actually a French pastor. He was quite a bit younger than Martin Luther. He took a lot of, oh, it's interesting, you see letters back and forth between him and Luther, uh, and later between Melanchthon and Calvin. Now, Calvin started out a lawyer and uh, became a a theologian. Kind of funny that that's kind of, you know, what was Martin Luther on his way to do before uh, the big storm that hit? He was on his way to become a lawyer as well, but uh, never became a lawyer, went right to become a theologian. Uh, John Calvin, on the other hand, became a lawyer before a theologian. I don't know if that says anything. Uh, hopefully you're not hearing there uh, lawyers lie. Oh, never mind. Okay, let's stop there. <laughs> oh, on the other hand, uh, you had Ulrich Zwingli, who was also present at that time. And Ulrich Zwingli was an interesting character. Uh, he was actually a chaplain in the Swiss Army, uh, and he and uh, he brought a very unique perspective uh, to sacramental theology, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But first, I want to look at John Calvin because John Calvin was actually fairly close to to Luther, except for there was uh, well one huge difference. So not so fairly close after all. But let me read the definition of of his definition from his Institutes. <clears throat> An outward sign by which the Lord seals on our conscience the promise of his goodwill toward us in order to sustain the weakness of our faith. And we in turn attest our piety toward him in the presence of the Lord and of his angels and before men. Okay, again, that's one of those long sentences that uh, that we need to break down because otherwise uh, we get a little turned around and confused there. And so uh, an outward sign, once again, we have that outward sign of the Lord for our conscience. Uh, uh, We see that physical element present, uh, that affirmation of the physical. Secondly, we see then, and this is where we start to diverge quite a bit, uh, that it is a, a goodwill toward us to sustain the weakness of our faith. Notice we don't see forgiveness of sin, a means of grace here, but we see a sustenance for our faith. And finally, this is the part that really, uh, where he really diverges from, uh, well, not only from Lombard, but, but Luther as well. And that is an atte- to attest our p- piety toward him in the presence of the Lord and angels and men. And why is this significant? Because this makes it about us. And as I said, we're going to talk about next week how, how the sacrament cannot be about us. But as we already talked about, that vow that was talked about as sacramentum, that was a vow by God made to us. That is the complete working of God. See, the, a sacrifice would be our piety, what we give to God. But a sacrament is what God does to us. It is completely pure gospel, him coming to us. And so we, we see a little bit of a divergence there, but also in a greater concern for us is that we don't see the forgiveness of sins. 
We see the sustenance of faith, which is great because we do believe the sacrament does that. But we don't see that forgiveness that comes, that fullness of God's grace, that full richness. Now, Ulrich Zwingli, like I said, he actually follows somewhat in page with John Calvin. But, he, but then again, he takes a big leap because he's what's called an Anabaptist. Now, we don't use that term so much today, but uh, maybe you've, uh, but some of their theology we still see practiced today. An Anabaptist, literally, it's uh, two Greek words, uh, ana and then baptizo, uh, li- and basically means baptized again or second baptism. And these people were, I mean, not just, the, uh, not just in the Lutheran church, but uh, throughout the church at this time, uh, the Anabaptists were highly persecuted because this actually went way against everything that was taught. What, what Zwingli was teaching was that you had to be baptized, if you will, a believer's baptism, as we talk about it now. That you had to be baptized again. Uh, the first one didn't take because you were an infant. But rather, now you have to be baptized uh, as, a, uh, as an adult who can accept the faith. And this, like I say, flies in the face of the face of that gift that comes to us of God's free grace. Now, as I, as I as I like to do, I'd like to actually come to Martin Luther now, and we're going to take the rest of our time today talking about how Luther defined a sacrament, and and the reason for this is because the sacrament, as Luther defined it, uh, his sacramental theology, huh, his uh, the way he taught uh, believed in God coming to us and through the sacraments, really shaped the rest of his doctrine. And let me say that again. His theology of the sacraments shaped the rest of his doctrine. It shaped his understanding of God's grace and his mercy to us. Now, th- now, as we talk about Luther, we remember that he's an Augustinian monk. And so he, was, he probably would have read most of Augustine's work. So he had influence from Augustine. But we also know that he was, would have been influenced by Peter Lombard because he was educated in the schools of that day. And as we look at, a, as, as, at Martin Luther, he would have even taught from Peter Lombard's sentences. Basically, it would have been as if he was standing there with his Bible in one hand and with the, com- with the sentences in the other hand as a commentary, uh, teaching uh, his, his students uh, the next group of theologians at the University of Wittenberg. And so as we look at Luther's theology, we know that it wasn't something new that he came up with on his own. It didn't just kind of fly out of his opinion and his decision, but, but this is grounded in, his, in, the, in the church fathers. It is grounded in the beliefs and teachings that the church held for years. And as we look at Luther's small catechism, we see that there are three criteria for the sacraments. And, 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 uh, and it, hopefully you guys know this. Hopefully this is kind of a bit of a uh, review here. But first and foremost, and most importantly, that a sacrament must be instituted by God in Scripture. That Jesus or, or the Father had to give us this gift. Secondly, that there is a physical element present. For instance, water or wine and for ins- or bread. And thirdly, the third, the third uh, had to provide forgiveness of sins. It had to be a means of grace. And this understanding of the means of grace is important because we see these means of grace not only in the sacrament, but we see this means of grace also in confession and absolution. And we'll talk about that in just a moment, that idea of confession and absolution. Because in the church, we actually struggle about whether or not that, it, that would be a third sacrament. But, but as we look at these means of grace from God, we see how both baptism and the Lord's Supper fall fit these three cr- criteria. They both provide forgiveness of sins. We see in Scripture the institution by God, and we see the physical elements present, which is really neat because we see God coming to us, the extraordinary coming to us in the ordinary. But I wanted to mention, as I said before, this diverges a bit from the Catholic teaching or the Eastern Orthodox teaching where they say that there are seven different sacraments. And I'd like to give you an example of two of their sacraments and why we would not count them as sacraments. The first one would be the sacrament of marriage. Now, I would say, uh, first and foremost, it is instituted by God, right? Yeah. I mean, sacrament is given to us. Uh, that sacrament is, or that marriage is given to us. Let's start over. Uh, from the very beginning, God instituted marriage between one man and one woman. Secondly, there is a physical element, right? How many of you received one of these when you, when you got married uh, from your wife or your husband? A, a wedding ring, right? And so we have a physical element present. But is there forgiveness of sins? Does forgiveness of sins come through the exchange of rings as the word of God is spoken? Well, no. Now, admittedly, there is a great deal of forgiveness in marriage, but it is not from the, it doesn't come from the exchange of rings, does it now? And this is important because this is one of the spots where, like I say, we diverge from the Roman Catholic Church. Let me give you a second example. The example of extreme unction. Perhaps many of you know this by its uh, more par- the, the common parlance, which is last rites. Extreme unction, uh, as we look at that, uh, there is a physical element. 
oil. They use anointing oil in this. There is forgiveness of sins because there's confession and absolution. But as we look at extreme unction, we don't find uh, grounding in Scripture, an institution by God for this. Now, I will say that we see where Jesus says, or actually I uh, can for, say uh, for certain in James as well, where they, where, the, the, where they talk about anointing the sick with oil. But those are the sick. That is not anointing the dead, uh, anointing those who are dying for forgiveness. And this is why we don't, would say that is not instituted by God. And as you look at the other sacraments, the other five, uh, well, there'd be three other sacraments that the, the Roman Catholic Church celebrates that we do not. All of them, uh, in some way or another, do not fit the criteria, those three that we have uh, from, from Luther's theology. Now, I did want to talk about one of them, one that we have that, that, like I said, has been a debated in the Lutheran Church. And that is the sacrament of penance, or as we call it, is, is confession and absolution. As we, and we celebrate confession and absolution in the church as a means of grace, a forgiveness of sins, sorry. Right? As, as you hear those words, as I say them, I forgive you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is not my forgiveness, but it's the forgiveness of God coming to you, right? Yes, maybe, kind of, a little. Okay, good. Uh, hopefully, I, at least a few yeses there. So, uh, that's good. And, and so when we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is, this is uh, straight from First John. So we have that institution by God in Scripture. We have the forgiveness of sins that come. But this is where the, de- the, the debate comes as to whether or not it should be a sacrament. And that is, what is the physical element? Interestingly enough, Martin Luther in his large catechism said that it would be a third sacrament. In the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Melanchthon makes mention of it as a possible third sacrament. But neither of them come down firmly. And this is why it still is debated in the church today, as to whether or not it should be a, sa- uh, a, a sacrament. Now, those who defend it as a sacrament would suggest that there's a, there is a physical presence. There either it is, as I would mentioned, the word of God. You, the absolution that is spoken, the confession that we speak, is almost word for word taken from Scripture. So it is, they would say maybe it is this, the Bible that we hold. That would be the physical. Yeah. Uh, then the other, uh, for those, those who also defend it, uh, will defend it from the front that there is a physical in the sense that we in our hearts, in our spiritually, we bow down before Lord, the Lord. There is a physical repentance on our part. Again, this is kind of, I think, grasping at straws. And I think part of the reason that as a Lutheran church, we, 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 won't, we don't want to go so far as to say it's a third sacrament. I mean, as, uh, well, Jim Christofferson and I have talked in the past, we would say maybe it's a half a sacrament. Uh, and so, uh, but what, what it is, what I would say, though, is clarify is it is still a means of grace. And this is where what's important here. It does provide the forgiveness of sins. It is God coming to us, and no matter where we are, offering that forgiveness. And that is what is significant about the sacraments in general. And as we, and, and as we wrap up our time together, I'd like to go back to Paul's definition. The secret things of God, the mysteries of God, those, those, those things that we are stewards of as God's people. Because that really does fully define what a sacrament is. As much as we've sought to do so by our own reason, by our own understanding, we know that we cannot define exactly what this wonderful gift is from God. We know that he provides us the forgiveness, that it is a means of his grace. But we don't know how he does it, other than that he does. And that in his word he promises that he will. All who believe and are baptized shall be saved. We know that. For, we, we say that almost every time we have a baptism. We turn to Mark 16, 16, and we see those words. That we have that salvation that comes. And as we look at the Lord's Supper, and, and we look at the account from Matthew chapter 28, we see those words that, uh, that uh, or, I'm sorry, not Matthew 28, Matthew 26, when Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper, and he says, for the forgiveness of sins. Both cases, he promises that gift of, uh, to us for our forgiveness. For, our, for out of his mercy and his grace. And as I used that term before, it's, it's the extraordinary of God coming to us in the ordinary. It's the mysteriousness of God coming to us, him revealing himself in ways that normally he is unrevealed. And we struggle when we come to that. And I'm just going to take a couple more moments before we wrap up here to talk about that, that revelation of God. Because when we talk about God, he reveals himself to us in, in, in his holy word. He reveals himself to us through the creation. He reveals himself to us through his law written upon our hearts. 
but so often we want to seek that unrevealed will of God. We want to seek after that, 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 that around, what's around the curtain, if you will, what's behind the shadow. And there are certain things he doesn't show to us. Whether it's because we can't understand or whether it's because he, he, we're not prepared to understand. He doesn't reveal every bit of his theology to us, every bit of himself to us, but he does reveal what is most important. And that is his mercy. That is his grace. That is his love for us. And so as we consider the sacraments, as we, consi- as we consider our worthiness before God, and as we consider what makes him special, keep in mind that it, what, that it is God. It is he who has made us worthy. It is he that makes them special. It is he that brings his grace to us. Let's join together in prayer. Please pray with me. Most gracious God in heaven, we give thanks to you for your holy word, which you have given to us, which you have dwelt among us through. We pray, Lord, that you would reveal to us uh, just, uh, uh, just your ways and your will in our lives. Lord, we give thanks to you for your sacraments, that even though we know that, they're, they're, that on this side of eternity that we have debates and we have struggles, help us to see that, uh, that they are your gifts. Help us to see them as your, your, your abundance of your love for us. And Lord, may we never, uh, may we never see the, what we might do, but rather what you might do through them. Lord, as you have revealed from old, you have shown us your great love not just through these sacraments, but ultimately through your death on the cross. And it's through your death on the cross that these means of grace mean something, as they are those means of grace to us, though. Help us to seek your forgiveness. Help us to repent to you and to know by by your love and by your mercy that we are forgiven. Father, we do give thanks to you for these gifts. And as we prepare to celebrate the gift of your supper, may we be filled up and made full. May our faith be strengthened. And may we know that forgiveness of sins. This we pray through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.